This is Unsilo, brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. Welcome to Unsiloed. This is Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here today with Marcus Dusatoy, who is a professor of mathematics. You're also the professor of the public understanding of science. It's a Simone chair, I guess, at University of Oxford. Also the author of multiple books, Music of Primes, Symmetry, The Great Unknown, and most recently, The Creativity Code, Art and Innovation in the Age of AI. Welcome, Marcus. Yeah, great to be with you. I spent a lot of time, both in my teaching and in the podcasts, talking about the impact that machine learning, that AI is having on, well, not just society, but kind of on the professions and on humanity. And, you know, one of the things that I think a lot of people have agreed on is that there is this comparative advantage, to use a term from economics, between, you know, what humans can do comparatively better than algorithms and, you know, what, well, I should say machine generated algorithms or machine implemented algorithms and what the machine learning can do. And I think almost everyone agrees that, well, if you're going to focus on what's uniquely human, you've got to focus on, you know, empathy and you've got to focus on creativity, right? And you got to focus on artistic production. Like this is something that is uniquely human. Not only can the animals do a poor job of this, but so too can these, you know, robots that we, we create. And I think this book, the creativity code, well, it kind of digs into that idea, but it says, hold on a second. You know, the dividing lines are not, are not as, as clear cut as we might think, and they may be, be shifting. And I think it really forces us to think carefully about not only what is creativity, but what is kind of uniquely human about creativity. Um, and I found the book uh, fascinating. So I don't know if that's a good, that was sort of my yeah, take think, on the book. Is that is that a fair description? Yes, exactly. I, I think, you know, I, I sort of went for this angle because, uh, you know, we're seeing machine learning, as you say, having a big impact on many different areas of society, but things we sort of find perhaps um, understandable and obvious, you know, recommender algorithms or uh, algorithms to help us drive cars or to do uh, better trading. Uh, but as you say, creativity the arts, music, uh, poetry, we regard as something rather unique to what it means to be human. I was really interested to explore the idea of whether this kind of the idea of machine learning, how powerful is it? Can it actually dig into something that we regard as incredibly human? And, and it actually you used a word which was very interesting in your introduction, which was empathy and the idea of understanding each other's emotions. And there's a Carl Rogers, the uh, psychologist, kind of proposed that creativity was probably our uh, most powerful tool that we developed to explore our own inner world and the inner world of uh, other humans as we began to understand that there seemed to be something going on inside. So, um, so it's interesting, the challenge of whether an algorithm could a achieve some level of understanding some level of moving us emotionally, which is sort of what we're expecting our art to do. And I think, you know, going back to what what is machine learning? Machine learning is about taking data and kind of distilling patterns inside their information, uh, the structures, hidden structures. And so, you see, if you give an algorithm, for example, our artistic output as a human species for the last couple of thousand years, which is an expression of our kind of emotional world, then, you know, it might not be surprising that a machine learning looking at this data might distill something about our own emotional world and be able to feed back, therefore, something which potentially will move us and potentially which might surprise us. Because the exciting thing is that this tool is discovering structures and patterns inside data sets that will somehow our embodied senses are unable to achieve. I'm, I mean, I often compare it a little bit to, you know, I think this is a moment where we've been handed a telescope like Galileo got a telescope, was able to look out into the night sky and see things, you know, that we weren't able to see with our, just our eyes. And this is as if we've been given a tool to look into data in a way, a depth and a complexity that is, a, is actually sort of revealing things, which, as you say, I think help us to understand our own human creativity as much as, you know, an algorithm doing something creative. 
Now, of course, that's not the same as creativity, right? Helping us to understand our creativity or, you know, jolting us into more creativity. I mean, that, that's perhaps a little bit different. And we want to dig into that distinction. But I also want to dig into this other distinction, which is that when humans create things, we sometimes describe their creations as creative and sometimes we describe it as derivative, right? So, you know, if, and we'll, we'll probably get into the music and the literature, but if, if a human artist just sort of cranks out a piece of music that sounds kind of like, you know, Bach. It's like, well, you know what? No matter how good it is, no matter how Bach-like it is, this person will probably never get any recognition simply because it's like, been there, done that. So one of the things that I spent all the time interviewing people who are uh, venture capitalists and venture capital, uh, you didn't mention it. You mentioned math, which I, I, I find fascinating because that most people don't think of math as creative or artistic, except for all the people who actually do it. <laughs> so we'll have to dig into that. But, but in venture capital, this is like a final frontier for machine learning, because if you use all of the previous successful kind of exits as your training data, then any new company that gets funded is just doing stuff that's already been done, right? <laughs> so like the thing that is, is new, it's almost by definition, if you're, if you're using training data, you're using stuff that's old, right? So isn't machine learning by its very nature, like designed not to be creative? Yeah, absolutely fascinating. So uh, I think to a certain extent, you're right, because you're taking data. Uh, and so how can it make something new out of that? Now, there are, there, there are a couple of things here. First of all, all artists begin by learning from the art of the past. So, you know, Picasso learned to paint in particular styles of the past. Musicians, Philip Glass was trained on finishing off Bach cantatas before he went on to do his own innovative work. So we all need to start with kind of a, a data set of the art of the past. But I, I totally agree. What one doesn't want is just producing pastiche, things that we've seen before. And I think some of the early projects, like, for example, the idea of using machine learning to produce a, a new Rembrandt, that's kind of interesting that it's able to do that and be very convincing. But after all, why do we need a, another Rembrandt? That really is pastiche. But there is an element, again, of revealing things inside that data that we hadn't seen before. So it might be that through doing this, we understand an artist in a new way. For example, if you take Jackson Pollock, it was a mathematical algorithmic analysis of Pollock's work that revealed that what he was doing was something rather unique. It wasn't something that, you know, my, my kids could have done in the back room. No, he was creating a fractal structure, which gives this wonderful sense of not being able to judge the scale of this thing. I think that's it. There's a potential for algorithms to actually reveal new things. And a, a very interesting example I talk about in the book related to music is a jazz improviser yeah, who the continuator uh, the jazz continuator a great name and he trained up um this piece of ai on his sound world and then he improvised with the algorithm and what was very interesting was his response he said i i, I recognize everything it's doing it's my sound world but it's doing things i've never thought of doing before and i think that's for me what's really a potentially exciting role that ai can play that we get very stuck in particular ways of using our, our data or our strategies. We don't realize there are many other things you can do with it. So even if you are just sticking with the data set you've got, there are still lots of undiscovered things in there. But I totally agree with you that the challenge is, can we actually shift it to something new? Those are the, the paradigm shifts, the phase changes, the really, truly wonderful creative moments in human history. And I am beginning to see emerge a style of algorithm which has the potential to do that. It's called a generative adversarial network, a GAN, and a lot of the kind of the uh, Good, art projects Ian people have seen. Exactly. You know, and I think, you see, this actually combines the element of, okay, we need to break out of the data that we have at the moment. So we need to challenge the algorithm to understand what is there, but then to move one step away from that uh, to to break style for example it can understand style and then it's tasked with breaking style and then you have this second algorithm which is the discriminator algorithm which says okay look um, i think that's too similar to style i've seen before or you've just gone too far and you you i don't recognize this as art 
these machine learning algorithms are great at playing games and to sort of change creativity into a game where you're sort of trying to make something new, but not too new, I think is a perfect territory for this kind of ab ability to push into something that we haven't seen before. And I think that's really exciting. And I've seen, you know, visual art, we've seen GANs in architecture, for example. And I think it sort of captures one of the elements of the creative mind that many artists and certainly as a mathematician, I recognize this, that you need a sort of two algorithms at work. One is the creator coming up with bubbling with new ideas. And then the second is like, oh, the judgment. No, that's no good. That doesn't work because of this. And, you know, I, in my own research, often pair up with another mathematician and we play these two roles, the, the creator and the discriminator. So it's interesting, I think one of the, some of the most interesting algorithms that we're seeing that it are, are beginning to look like they're making something genuinely new are capturing that element that we take advantage of as humans. Yeah, yeah, I like this distinction. I was actually teaching just last night in my behavioral finance class. We were talking about how, you know, sometimes you want a division of labor where you want, you know, this crazy idea generator person who is thinks that every, you know, idea is fantastic and then you need this sort of, you know, the CFO who's like the Dr. No. <laughs> like, you know, just yes, you know, yes. no, 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 it's not going to work. No, it's going to work. And and somehow, you know, if you have a good balance of those types of people in your organization, then your organization will probably innovate. But if you just have one or the other, it's, yeah. it's never going to, never going to innovate. Yeah. So I think that's what you're capturing in these uh, new sorts of algorithms, which uh, are re really exciting. So I think there's a lot of potential that hasn't been tapped yet to apply these GANs to other areas of creativity. Well, you propose this thing called the Lovelace test, right? And I think we all know what the Turing test is, which is when you're interacting with a computer, can you tell it's a computer? And there's a lot of criticisms that have been, you know, levied against that and how it's inadequate. But you proposed this, this Lovelace test, which is a way of evaluating some work of creativity and, and determining whether or not it was computer generated. And I think you begin the book with that. And then each time you go in with music and visual art and so forth, you know, you sort of, sort of apply this. Could you, could you elaborate, you know, first of all, what's the inspiration? Tell us just a bit about kind of Ada Lovelace, an analytical machine, and kind of how, uh, I don't know, prophetic yes. that was? Yes. So Ada Lovelace, we celebrate as the first computer coder. She was a young Victorian woman. Her mother was very excited to take her along to the sort of big experiments of the day. And she took her along to see uh, Charles Babbage's analytic engine, which was this machine, which was meant to speed up doing calculations and means that humans could do something more interesting. But when Lovelace saw this machine, she realized, uh, hold on, this could do something much more interesting than just crunching out long division, for example. And, and she started to write down these instructions to, to make it do more interesting things, which eventually got published, I think, as an appendix to a paper by a man. Um, but we now recognize that those notes were really the first example of code, getting a machine to do interesting things. And she already speculates in there, maybe the machine can produce uh, scientific pieces of music of any degree of complexity or extent. So we're already fantasizing about the power of a machine to, to make music. And it's interesting she chose music because I think it is one which is of the arts, which is probably closest to mathematics and has a kind of... It's the art of patterns and maths is the science of patterns. But she had a word of caution, which she said, we, we, sh we shouldn't really say that the machine is originating anything because it's a human that is writing down the instructions to tell the machine what to do. And I think to a certain extent, she ha had a point that you know, the machine might be able to do things at speed or at depth that a human could never achieve. But ultimately, surely we should credit the creativity with the human that told the machine what to do. And I think that's genuinely what's changed with this new idea of machine learning, because this is a kind of change in the way we're writing code. In the past, code was written in this very top-down manner, exactly as she did it, set of instructions, if this, then do that. And the human was really in control of the decision-making process of the machine. But with machine learning, we're getting code which is changing, mutating, updating parameters inside the set, adding extra layers of code to cope with failure on the last round of looking at the challenge it was set. So we're starting to see code, which is beginning to just drift more and more away from what the human originally wrote down to set it off on its learning process. So 
So I think the challenge now, and this is what called the Lovelace challenge, I mean, not actually something that I coined. I think uh, several different groups have talked about the idea of the Lovelace challenge. But it's, you know, can a computer originate a creative work of art, which shouldn't just be a result of perhaps tapping into some random number generator or the weather or something or a hardware error. It really should be genuinely a product of the code and not something external. Because often artists try and give agency to code by tapping into some sort of something random. And because you can't explain the randomness, it, it feels like the code is got its own agency. And the test doesn't want that to happen. So, but the challenge is that ultimately the person who wrote the original code can't explain how the code has produced the output that it has. So the explanation shouldn't be something that even the code really can't understand. It's, it's, it's a product of the code, yet the original coder can't explain it. So, so that's the challenge. Is the product, the creative output, genuinely something which we have to credit the learning of the code that has been responsible for that and, and not the original coder? And the example I start in the book, actually, which I think is I, I think the first example of passing this Lovelace test is in the context of uh, an algorithm playing a game. Um, this is the game of Go against uh, Lee Sedol, uh, the best humans have at this game, the Korean player. And this piece of code was generated using machine learning such that it took human games, tried to understand the patterns inside there that made a winning move, then cr started creating synthetic games, started playing itself. And through this learning process, this piece of code called AlphaGo emerged, which was incredibly powerful, but in a way that I think surprised us because it wasn't just that it was playing the game in the way that humans play at a high level. It was playing the game in a genuinely new way. And in the second game, it produced this move, which now we, you know, it's move 37 of game two of, again, uh, that AlphaGo against Lee at all. And it was a move that traditionally uh, a human player would never make at this point in the game. Uh, your Go master would slap your wrist if you made this move. So it, it really surprised us when it made this move. And yet ultimately it was able to show how this move was very valuable towards the end of the game. And, and really it was that move that won it the game. And you see why I call this the create, genuinely this is a good example of the creativity of the code and not the humans, a deep mind who coded it up is that this emerged out of the learning process. And I think if a human Go player had seen that line of code, it would have been deleted because they would have said, well, look, that's a terrible move. It's learned something bad. So that line of code play, it was a, a move which played quite deep into the center of the board early on, which is not something you're meant to do. It, it emerged out of the learning process of the code. And so I think you can call that move something which genuinely deserves to be credited to the code and not the original coders. So, so I would say that's the first example of kind of computer creativity and passing this Lovelace test. Okay, it's the context of a game, not uh, the sort of more messy world of human creative art and things. But uh, I think that's why I wanted to start writing this book was seeing that moment. Okay, it's a nice, clean, confined environment of a game, just black and white pixels on a 19 by 19 grid. Where else could it go? So that was kind of the the launch pad for the book. But but I think the reason why that move is so impressive it, it's it's not because it's something that a human wouldn't do. It seems like it's because it's the kind of thing that a human would do. Not I mean not most humans, but like if if a human did it, we would say that's a genius move, right? So you talk about the idea of a, a local maximum and a global maximum, and I. I talk about hill climbing algorithms in the context of business strategy. And I talk about how operations in business is about just kind of getting higher on the hill you already are. But strategy is about, you know, locating that hill in the distance. One of the examples that, that I use is, is this idea of like, you know, the Fosbury flop, right? You know, from high jumping. If you told a machine to do a better job of high jumping, they would focus for the most part on all these kind of incremental adjustments to the mechanics of the scissor jump. Cause I remember I did this when I was in, in junior high school and you know, the Fosbury flop is a categorically different approach to the problem. And, and when we see that it's, it's like, wow, that is, that's creativity. Like that's genius. That's artistic because it, it's a completely different leap. And we don't expect machines to do that, right? Just because of the nature of the programming. We expect yeah. machine learning to just keep going up that hill and, and not making those leaps. So, so what is the, na yeah, I mean, the, what is the nature of the training? I mean, because what, what I found interesting about AlphaGo is that 
there were two pieces to it, right? One is the part where the machine just played itself forever. But, but the, the starting point was the training data of human games. Without either one of those pieces, that would never have gotten to where it was, right? Well, that's very interesting because uh, a later iteration called Alpha Zero scrapped all the human games. And what was very striking was, uh, as you say, this then requires tabula rasa learning, you know, a, a blank slate. And it, it absolutely wasn't clear that it would be able to generate enough material to get going. But it turned out that Alpha Zero was far superior to AlphaGo and would always beat AlphaGo. So it seems like we led it astray. <laughs> with our human games in it in its learning process. So but I, I think you're absolutely right that there, there's no guarantee that this learning process wouldn't have got stuck on a local maximum, as you say. And and you know, it felt like, okay, a, any way that I move to change my parameter decreases my ability to play this game. So I'm going to stop here. Certainly when I talked to Deep Mind, they did hit a moment where it had got rather stuck in a rut. And they knew that there were types of games that it would lose if it played this. I mean, one, one of the, the European Go master sort of played the game and said, look, it's, it's just got stuck in a slightly bad way of playing. So, so I think that there isn't ultimately any guarantee that you won't get stuck in these local maxima. What I think is quite exciting is this idea of crossing the adaptive valley. You know, you've got to go down and then up somewhere else. And so the power of the machine is probably the ability to try enough scenarios and more scenarios than we would as a human to be able to sort of clear through the mist that is around our local maximum that we've got stuck on and actually to explore that there is a gradient further away that is seems to be going up and to explore that. It is sort of taking advantage of you know, what machines are good at doing uh, things at depth, more data, faster. So we're able to explore the terrain to perhaps find these other mountains, which are, you know, reveal that where we're standing is just a little molehill. <laughs> um, I think that's the challenge in any particular scenario, whether the actual process will ultimately find you the optimal way. Because as you say, most of the time, the way the algorithms are working are in making steps in the parameter sets as if you are in a landscape and just trying to find where the gradient is still ascending. And if you're on a local maximum, you're not going to go up anymore. One of the other challenges, and I think this is interesting in respect of AlphaGo, because when I've seen these algorithms applied to other artistic disciplines, one of the things I think it has quite a lot of problem with is temporal element to a piece of art. So it seems to be very good at creating things like a, a static piece of art or creating music locally, which sounds convincing, either something like Bach or some jazz improvising. But it doesn't seem to have a very good sense of a global narrative. And so the even like the text generation algorithms like GPT-3, amazing stream of consciousness coming out of these uh, algorithms. But, um, you know, I've seen a novel which was co-written by GPT-3 uh, and a novelist and really fascinating, challenging kind of paragraphs. But ultimately, I never felt a sense of uh, overarching narrative emerging. And, and in the music as well, I find the jazz continuator interesting for five minutes and then I get bored. So I think that's an interesting challenge, the, the temporal element, which it did seem to achieve in the case of AlphaGo, because it really made a move which it was anticipating later on in the game would be have value. So it's not like it can't see ahead, but um, I'm kind of intrigued by that element of this thing being a very good algorithm for either static things which are atemporal or, or just local temporal production. Well, for AlphaGo, I mean, the, the end goal is pretty clear, right? I mean, we know what it's trying to do. So you can do reinforcement yeah. learning on this thing in a way that is a lot harder for, you know, works of, of creativity. But I want to get into this attribution notion, right? Because this also has implications for the way we think about intellectual property. So if I'm Pollock, I'm doing this and I kind of get tired of doing it and I can come up with a robot that will do it for me. I, I don't think anybody would, would say that, oh, well, that, that's, you know, Pollock doesn't deserve credit if he is the one, even if he, even if he didn't build the robot, even if he doesn't understand the laws of physics or can't draw, you know, trigonometry or whatever to explain, you know, what's going on. If he's 
setting the thing up and, and, and letting it work, it's not really any different from him hiring a, a staff to kind of, I mean, if you look at what Anish Kapoor does or what Jeff Koons does, Damien I mean, Hurst, you know, they just kind of sketch it out and say, you go, you guys go do it. But we give, we give them credit. And there was this intellectual property case that you described, which I teach law it, where the ape was given a camera and took a picture and was the person who had given the camera to the ape was denied intellectual property protection for this, which seems to me super odd, right? Because giving it to an ape doesn't seem much different from giving it to a laser printer or something something like that to execute on. At what point does it make sense for us to divorce the credit from the designer of the, the algorithm? One other example of this is in, in medicine now. The FDA, when you design an algorithm for diagnostics and so forth, the FDA at one point used to say that anytime the algorithm changed because of learning, you had to go through clinical trials again, right? Because now you're using a new, you're using a new algorithm, right? But that defeats the whole purpose of having you know, machine learning in, in diagnostics. And recently they've, they've changed their approach and they say, okay, if you set up the, the basic learning algorithm, then you can keep revising and sharpening and, and improving the recommendation, the algorithm without having to come back and, and revisit it. We're going to give you credit, the, the ongoing mutations of this algorithm. When we think about attribution, both philosophically and, and legally, where do we draw this, this line or where, where does it, where does it make sense yeah. to draw this line? You see, I think we're falling into a trap, which is this, we love the idea of the lone genius being responsible for the creation. So, you know, Jackson Pollock being the creator of this piece of artwork, or uh, as you say, Anish Kapoor. I mean, I, I know Anish quite well. I've been down to his studio and, you know, he wanders around there. Everybody's implementing his wonderful ideas. Um, but I, I quite like uh, this idea that Brian Eno came up with, that we need to move away from genius and talk about something called seniors, which is a recognition that uh, any creative work actually has many different people contributing to it in, in different ways. And so a lot of artists will have been influenced by other artists. Um, so, uh, you know, it's a question whether they should be have any credit or, and, and sometimes if you use material, you will give some sort of ownership to, you know, if you're remixing uh, sounds, for example, there's an element of creativity, but it's got input as well. So I think what we'll see is a, a sort of shared ownership emerging because we'll recognize that, yeah, there's a, somebody who's written some code, which is telling something what to do, but then there's the people who have created the particular data set maybe on which this code then learned and, and they are part of that creative process. I think there are going to be new jobs emerging like the data curator, for example, who will be very influential in actually making decisions about what data to feed a particular algorithm that will produce different outputs. We're already seeing really interesting divergence, uh, you know, where an algorithm is given different data sets. And, and so the curator is suddenly becoming very much part of that creative process. And, and also the, uh, the kind of code it, it itself, I think, perhaps should be there. So maybe, you know, I think if you look at the film industry, I think in some ways they've started to solve this because a, a film generally very difficult to say who's the creator of a film. There are so many different elements to it, the writer, director, actors. There's so many different components that there is almost a corporate identity which is owns the the film and everyone sort of feeds into that. So I think what we'll see emerging is actually maybe a, a, a fairer attribution, uh, something that we should have or, already done years before machine learning appeared on the on, on the scene about really recognizing um, that there are many people. I think I, I quoted Carol Oates, for example, novelist who said the same thing that you know, I really need to recognize that I'm not the only person creating the, what I do. There's so many other components to it. But there's also the difference between kind of the creation and, and the execution, right? So for instance, you talk about in Pixar, the human will create the basic architecture of the narrative and then will sort of delegate to the software to kind of flesh out the, the background or whatever. And, you know, presumably you could maybe come up with a tune and then have the, the orchestration automated in, in some way. And, and I think even in, in, in math, you distinguish between kind of math and, and computation, where computation is what you delegate to the, to the, the, yes. the mindless machine, but the, you kind of reserve the math part or the proof generation part to the human. 
or is it just a question of like ever increasing capacity to delegate, ever increasing capacity to, you know, routinize? I mean, this is what we've been doing since the beginning of humanity is we've been just kind of developing yeah. routines and then rinse, wash, repeat the routines and then move on to just focusing on, okay, how do I tweak the routine? How do I modify the routine? How do I improve the routine? And that's the, the, what, what the, what the, yeah, is, it, doing. The, the, this is why I think there, there is a genuine difference happening in, in this particular period where it isn't just, um, uh, a, a matter of getting the machine to implement. I mean, this is again, that difference between Lovelace, the, the top down idea that, yeah, we we're just delegating the machine to do all the really boring, um, stuff of just churning through applying, you know, some fractal algorithm to produce wonderful landscapes in Pixar animations that now we don't have to do that all by hand. But I think we, that, that is, we, we understand that, but now there's something new happening where actually, um, no, the, the actually the algorithm seems to be spitting out things that are, are not what we intended it to do and we're actually finding that quite exciting and stimulating our own sort of uh, creativity and what i love about this what's happening is there seems to be a genuine kind of dialogue almost between the algorithm and the the human where each one is sort of bouncing back ideas and and getting sort of pushed out of their comfort zone by seeing what the other is outputting i think there's a very interesting example uh, where in some ways, this technology is, is is being really powerful. Which, for example, you know, if you're playing a computer game and you want music alongside what you're doing, yet everybody is playing their own game in a very individual way, going into different regions, and so actually, you know, there's no way that. It, uh, I mean, in the past, it, you'd feel quite clunky those shifts. It would just be a sort of shift of scene and and. Uh, it wouldn't feel like the the score was matching exactly what you're doing, but machine learning can now adapt and change and and actually write these things. So I think it's a kind of genuine collaboration between a human who's kind of seeding the ideas, yet what actually is output is you know really dependent on using this technology to write a kind of bespoke a piece of music for your gameplay. And I think for me, one of the exciting things would be, for example. When I write a book like The Creativity Code, I have to write one book which works on many different minds. And of course, everyone has different levels. Everyone's like, some people know what an algorithm is. Some people are terrified by the word. And I have to write a book which sort of works on many different platforms. Um, I'm quite excited about the idea of perhaps working with an algorithm that would get to know you, for example, understand the books that you have read, and that together we would write a book which was bespoke for that particular reader. I think that's a very exciting, realizable project in the future. Well, there was one paragraph in the book that was machine generated. You didn't tell us which one it was. I, I, I think I was kind of a little disappointed that you didn't have a, like an answer key <laughs> well, in the back. I, I was, uh, yeah. I had a guess, but I, I had no, uh, no, no proof which one it was. Well, it's very interesting because, you know, I, I, during talks about the book, I sort of set a challenge that I would give a, a, a bottle of claret from my Oxford college to the first person to discover the passage. What was slightly was depressing was how many people made suggestions that were actually my own, I thought, beautiful prose. <laughs> um, and, and oh my gosh, because I think it's blindingly obvious which passage it is because I think it's so badly written. Um, but so was, this was a slightly... I think it backfired slightly in saying, or oh, maybe all my writing is, um, but yeah, I mean, I, it was interesting because I told the algorithm and I don't, you know, at that time, something like GPT-3 hadn't come on the scene yet. I think, uh, some of the early iterations had been. So and the algorithm actually, uh, I think, you know, I told it a story I wanted it to tell. I knew there was a lot of data online about the story. So I knew it had multiple versions that it could go and get its data from and then, and then to produce its own. And I must say, I don't think I say in, in, in the book that ultimately I, I managed to kind of, I, I think it was close to plagiarism. What it was doing was not innovative enough and sort of pushing the boundary of what, what it had learned from. And I think that's got better. I think something like GPT-3, I'd, I'd be very interested to apply the same challenge to it now. And of course, I was very nervous about this book, about how quickly it might go out of date, because obviously it's a very fast moving subject. But I've been quite pleased that there have been very few stories that I felt, oh gosh, that's a completely new way of doing things. So I, so I think I chose a kind of sweet moment when a lot of people were trying out different ideas of how to use deep learning, machine learning to do interesting things. So I feel that the book is pretty representative of, of everything which is still going on outside there. 
The only one I would add, actually, was one of the kind of themes that runs through the book is, well, what about my own subject of mathematics? You know, I first sight people would say, well, surely, you know, that's what Ada Lovelace went to see, you know, Babbage making a machine do maths. But no, it wasn't doing maths. It was doing arithmetic. And that's the kind of bread and butter. But mathematics is something much more creative. And we use this word creativity as a kind of protective shield about against why a computer can't do what we're doing, because we're making lots of leaps into the unknown, um, lots of choices, things we choose, proofs which kind of move us emotionally because they've got some moment, aha moment in them. So, so there's an emotional resonance to mathematics. So I, I was very intrigued to see, well, you know, could machine learning, could it do maths? Could it make proofs that would kind of excite us? And at the time, there was a project that DeepMind were actually doing. And I didn't feel it was, it was producing new proofs, but they were not things that I found interesting. And I think there was a story which emerged in December of last year, which made a nature paper, which was uh, the use of machine learning, actually not to prove theorems, but to suggest new conjectures. And I think that's something that it would be a very powerful tool for, because, you know, what a conjecture often is in mathematics is spotting a connection between two very different data sets and saying, hey, look, I think this is the same, two sides of the same equation. So I would have loved to have put that story in because I think it was genuinely, you know, two projects, one at my university in Oxford, another at another university, which revealed new things that we were then challenged to prove as, as humans. But on the whole, I'm pretty happy with having covered a lot of the bases of things you know, it's just more of the same that I'm seeing. Well, I think embedded in the book is kind of a love letter to mathematics because, you know, you really do talk about the artistic nature, the creativity that's embedded in math. But we talked about, I've, in a different conversation, I talked about how accountants, a lot of people thought that accountancy would disappear with better computation. Because if you go back 100 years ago, what, what accountants did is they spent all their day adding and subtracting, right? That was what they did. They were accountants, <laughs> yes. right? And so the exercise you would give an accountant in their training was you'd give them a phone book and say, add up all the numbers in the phone book. And they just do this over and over again. Now we get, we get Excel and boom, accountants didn't disappear. They've moved on. When you talk about this idea of generating conjectures, this is kind of like a, a almost like a recommendation engine for research. And I was thinking, wouldn't that be cool if we had that for, for PhD students? You know, they come in and they're like, what do I do my dissertation on? Well, let's just hit up the old recommendation engine and then see what, see what they tell you. But, but there's going to be some limitations there. You, you talk about how, you know, recommendation engines, even the best ones. I mean, I loved, I've used, used Pandora for a long time and it's like, oh, wow, this is great. This is all this new music that I'd never heard of. But if, if you're listening to all of this rap, they're never going to tell you, oh, you know, you really ought to check out handle, you know, like it's never going to happen simply because the, you know, the limits of the, of the way this model works. Do you think that at some point, you know, the, the recommendations engines will be able to, to be even better in that respect? Yes. I mean, I think one thing I was very nervous about recommender algorithms was, were we all going to be pushed to the same 10 books to read, the same 10 records to listen to? And I was quite encouraged that even the algorithms that we have at the moment, that isn't the case. And as you say, we are getting pushed into bits of the library that we never would have gone into without the these tools. So I already think that's quite exciting. And I think it's a actually a product of many of these algorithms being uh, mathematically chaotic in nature, in that um, a very small change in my preferences compared to yours would actually produce very different outputs. That's exciting for me because it, it, it means that we're actually being pushed to, to find things that we never would have. I mean, what, what I do, for example, with my social media following is to add a few people that are very uh, contrary politically. So I don't get stuck in, you know, you're called unsiloed. I mean, I think one of the challenges is how do you unsilo yourself? How do you get out of these bubbles politically, musically, uh, artistically? And, you know, maybe that's what the algorithm needs to do is to every now and again, throw in something unexpected and random just to see how that uh, little bit of grit reacts in what you're, you know, do, do you stop listening to the things that it's, it's starting to recommend and realizes that bit of grit wasn't very helpful, but to throw, to keep throwing that in. So I think that's um, a way to kind of make sure that we don't get too siloed. 
So that would be kind of like combinatorial creativity, right? So if, if we imagine we had this recommendation engine for, for PhD students, right? It could be like, oh, let's, let's just take this existing model and, you know, apply it to a data set that hasn't been looked at yet. I mean, that's a classic PhD problem. And that would be sort of, yeah. I guess, you know, exploratory creativity to some degree. But if you said, hey, let's, you know, let's look at the, um, the, the mathematics of choreography or something like that, then it'd be like, okay, that, now that, that's a little bit more combinatorial. And I think yeah. you, you have some of these, you know, what if algorithm you're talking about sort of at the end of the book with respect yes, to yes, exactly. yeah, yeah. Like generating these. Now, presumably, 90% of these what ifs you, you can look at and say, no, nah, no, nah, that, that's, that's probably you know, never going to work. Uh, but, but, yeah. you know, so you do have to have some, I guess, human curation because some of them are going to be kind of, kind of nuts. Well, well, that's very interesting because, you know, actually that, that was, that algorithm is actually looking at the output and only putting forward things that it believes would pass a particular threshold for being interesting for us as humans. So, so it really took um, data sets of stories and then it generated these kind of strange combinations of ideas. But then, you know, almost like these generative adversarial networks, there was a generator one, but then there was a discriminator, which, which did kind of judge these against what we did like as stories. So, because that's one of the, I, I think, dangers of using computers in kind of artistic generation is that, well, we can just press print and the whole thing, you know, it spews out thousands and thousands of artworks. And then, you know, we're, we're left with having to sift through them and find the ones that we think are, are interesting. You know, that's a bit like, I mean, I, I use this kind of metaphor of the Library of Babel that Borges talks about, you know, this library contains every, every single possible book that it's, you know, that you can write, but although it contains everything, it contains nothing because nobody's made any choices. So, so I think that's been an important element that's been put into these algorithms quite often is that there has to be a sort of judgment made by the algorithm to kind of sift through, to make offerings that are, are, are likely to be of interest to us and not just completely bonkers. Now, look, when it comes to reporting, for instance, I, I've always been kind of puzzled by why we need this, right? So the classic example is that auto-generated reports of like sport matches, right? And so it's like they take pure statistics like, okay, this guy had this many hits and this many strikes and this many balls, and then they convert it into pros like and then the batter came up and then he hit the ball and then you know whatever and i i think i always think that what, after you read this you just reconvert it back into you know the, the the numbers that were used to construct the story like it seems kind of bizarre that it, it's almost like with google where you want to you know order something from a restaurant so you type in the item and they pick up the phone and they call and they talk to a human on the other end. But normally on the other end, you have like an algorithm that recognizes voices. So I just want a pizza and they just want to make a pizza. But we go through this crazy task of having a, a fake voice tell a fake ear, you know, that, that they want a pizza in English, which seems kind of kind of crazy. I don't think that most, you know, there's going to be reporters that aren't going to be out of work and there's going to be artists that aren't out of work. Yeah. And but we think that machine generated art is still at the stage where it's it's not super interesting right so spotify has been accused of generating genre music and and i think if it's like i don't know edm or smooth jazz i don't think anybody would ever notice but if it's if it's a, a maybe a more sophisticated genre you know they, they might be more likely to notice but you point out that even in the more sophisticated genres the, the algorithms are getting pretty good at generating music, which we think is, is human generated. Although the critics would probably say, yeah, it's, it's not, it's not new or fresh. Yeah. But I think that's interesting because I, I, you see, I don't think the challenge here is to, uh, you know, the top tier of artistic human creativity. I think there, the interesting thing is, is it stimulating them to do more interesting things? I, I think the real threat is to that second level down, which are the people who are writing jingles for corporate videos. And in the past, you know, that costs a bit of copyright to the, um, to the artist, you know, the ability now to just generate uh, a particular piece of music with, with a certain mood set like music, that you don't have right? to paint. You know, you're in the dentist's office. Yeah, but you know, that's all often a, a corporate video needs is, is something of a particular mood or, 
I mean, there's a wonderful genre now of, of computer game music, um, but on the whole, quite often they don't need anything particularly exciting. Um, but coming back to your journalism uh, points, one of the exciting uses, I think, of, of uh, computers to generate like sports reports is people with fantasy football teams uh, who want a particular report for their team. And, and there's no way you could have ever had a, a human writing reports for all of the kind of millions of fantasy football teams. But, you know, they've managed to use these algorithms to write for you your own particular weekend report. Um, and I think, you know, maybe it's because we're both data literate, but I think uh, you're overestimating how much people want numbers changed into natural language. Um, and I think, again, that's somewhere where, you, you know, I've seen this a lot in kind of business in economics where, you know, to take uh, huge data sets generated by business uh, and to have an algorithm which can actually translate that into natural language for those who are not so data literate to to interpret will be a, a very powerful tool and actually is something again you just can't do this at scale having a, a human going through uh, and distilling all of that information and actually you know, a lot of people say well i'm now freed up i don't have to write those boring business reports uh, off the data set that the companies churned out are going to actually do something much more interesting sort of analyzing the, the reports that are now coming out so i i think there is a an interesting role for these algorithms to to take raw data into natural language well we spent time talking about how much of the creative process can be done by computers maybe switch gears and talk about you know what is still unique about the human act of both creation and of exposing ourselves to creativity. And, and you mentioned that you quote someone who said, well, you know, when I l look at a real Rembrandt, I feel this kind of soul to soul communication. You know, what, what exactly is that that we, we experience when you talk about what you're doing when you are creating, for instance, when you're developing a proof, you, you have this aha moment, you have this, this moment of, uh, and you know, there's a, obviously a chemical aspect to it, right? You know, we get the dopamine surge and so forth. And as far as we know, software does not experience that dopamine moment. There's no aha moment. The, the computer doesn't say, yeah, man, you're gonna believe this. Like, I, I had this amazing experience, right? As far as we know, there's n there isn't that um, desire for creativity. W what is it that's still unique about the human uh, aspect of creativity? Yeah, no, I, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, the desire for creativity comes from our inner conscious world and our emotional world, and and our we want to explore our own world, which often is unarticulated, and we we try to find ways to to examine it, to understand what we're feeling, then to communicate that with somebody else. You know, it uh, is the pain that you're feeling like the pain that I'm feeling, and so I, I think. You know, I make a conjecture in the book that I think that probably creativity emerged about the same time as human consciousness, probably maybe about 40,000 years ago that, you know, there was a shift in the mind and, and the two sort of went, went together. And that's why I think, you know, genuine computer creativity will probably emerge when there is an inner world of the computer that it has the need to tell us about to say actually you know what i'm now no longer just some sort of bunch of instructions there is something going on inside and and we're going to have to find tools to to know that phase change moment it, it may never happen but i don't see a priori why it couldn't because you know i think our own consciousness is a product of yeah of chemistry biology physics maths but you know why couldn't that happen in a computer and if it does it's probably going to be very different to ours and so I, I think that it will then suddenly have the urge to try and you know express itself through a novel um to to indicate that something um has happened but i tell you i think there's already something interesting happening which is the code that's being produced is so complex, the layers of decision-making process, you know, in the past codes used to be written in a very efficient manner. We prized, you know, very clean, efficient code, but now we don't care because the, the, we've got enough room in a computer to write it all out, which means that the machine learning is producing code that we don't really understand how it's making its decisions. And so it's almost like it's got an inner world. It's not a conscious one, but maybe we could call it subconscious. And it's unable to articulate quite often, you know, we ask it, ask it to say, why did you make that decision? In a way, it's unable to do that because we're sort of trying almost to compress a very high dimensional decision-making process into something 
s- smaller dimensional and it can't do it. So I think we already need tools to examine the inner workings of the code. And for example, there was this project, um, Deep Dream, which Google used their vision recognition software to produce visuals. And, you know, it was almost like an inverse uh, thing. It said, okay, I'm going to give you random pixels. Of what do you see in there? And just accentuate the visual that you're seeing. That actually enabled us to understand bad learning that was happening inside the algorithm because sometimes it would produce, for example, there was one image where it started to produce dumbbells. It could see dumbbells, but the dumbbells always had arms attached to them. And we realized in retrospect, oh, it had only learned on images where the dumbbells were being held by strong men and women. And so it didn't understand that this wasn't just an extension of our anatomy when we became really strong. So I think already we're starting to see art uh, and the creativity, asking a piece of code to be creative is already, you know, serving the same function it does for us as humans to understand our inner worlds. It's almost be being used as a quite interesting new tool to probe the inner world of this code, which is too complex for us to read line by line. Yeah. So I think those things tell us not just about how the computers are thinking, so to speak, but oftentimes they tell us about well, how we are thinking. And, you know, with GPT-3, I've had some other conversations about how it kind of uncovers whatever racist or sexist thing. You know, we, we see that and we're like, oh man, this, this code is sexist. And it's like, well, no, actually not. It's, it's the code is is just, you know, reflecting the training set. And so it's yes. it's telling us something about ourselves maybe that we, we don't want to see. So it tells us about how we think. It tells us maybe a little bit more about our creative process and, and so forth. But I think to go back to what you were saying, you quote Wittgenstein, who said, you know, if a lion could talk, we, we wouldn't understand what it was saying. So if the computers develop a, a, a sense of self, and start communicating. Will we understand it? And I think the process which by which a lion was generated was was not directed by humans. It was directed by, you know, evolution or you know, some people would say God. The evolution of the the algorithms. This is really it's a human directed process. So wouldn't we expect computers, if they could talk, to kind of be much more likely to speak our language than 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 a, a lion would? Yes, I think that's. Very interesting because, first of all, I, what I've seen is some of the storytelling algorithms. What's been interesting emerging from there is that um, the algorithms seem to have a sense of empathy with human storytelling, uh, and so you know I think that's what we want. We want AI which is on our side, and so if it's actually learning from our emotional world, our data sets, maybe that's a way of creating something which is closer to uh, the way we're thinking. But but actually, what I'm beginning to see emerging is a level of the creativity that I, I think humans are finding it very difficult to engage with. I mean, we talked about what's unique to our own human creativity, and I think our embodiment is a, a very important part of that. Um, that and a lot of AI research has been a, about you know intelligence is so connected to um, our embodiment that we need to explore AI through robotics. We have to put it inside something which is engaging with the world. But if if it's not got that I- embodiment. Uh, what I'm starting to see is the creativity of the AI is almost too complex for our, our human mind to navigate. You know, if it's a piece of music, it, it's just got a level of complexity that we can't sort of break down and, and hear. I mean, Nancaro, for example, who writes these pieces of music, I mean, as a human uh, uh, composer, but but already I think they're quite challenging because they're, they're four machines and the kind of rhythm structure is almost like Oh, wow, I'm, I'm I'm lost listening to this, and I think you know you start to see the visual worlds that AI is creating. Um, again, it's it's got a complexity to it that um, I think we're starting to find a bit uneasy and and not able to in- engage with. And I think what we we'll start to see is AI producing art for other AI to enjoy, not for humans to enjoy. And one of my favourite um, AI movies is the film Her, which is about a human who falls in love with his operating system. System, and then is is very dismayed to find that this operating system is having relationships with like ten thousand other humans, and and you know the operating system says, well, yeah, but you humans are just so slow. I mean, uh, you know, it's it's painful on this side. So, and eventually the operating system gets off with another operating system and leaves the humans behind. But I think that's 
possibly what we'll start to see happening is that AI is going to start looking at humans like humans look at mountains. You know, mountains for us don't change. They don't move. But actually over, you know, deep time, a mountain is very dynamic and has a personality and goes up and down and uh, or a forest, for example. And I think just this element of AI being able to manage things at a speed and, and, and temporal element that we won't be able to engage with might mean that we start to see a real you know, the, like the lion, we really just won't understand it because it it doesn't need to be embodied and it can therefore kind of trip off in directions that are just going to leave us behind. Well, Marcus, this is fascinating. I wish we had time to talk more about math because this is an area which, um, you know, <laughs> you're, you're passionate about and which uh, I'm profoundly ignorant in. So, <laughs> but I think we'll have to save that for another time. Thank you. Another so much. time. Yeah. So this book, The Creativity Code, it's, it's really, uh, it's really fascinating. It's highly interdisciplinary and it raises a ton of questions, uh, more questions than answers, which is my kind of book. So thanks so much for joining me. Yeah, it was great to be on. This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. 